Okay, here we go. Hi, welcome. I'm Mary Burke. I'm the CEO of the Academy of Science of St. Louis. We are, for those of you who've been here before, I'm sure you've heard this before, we are a 160-year-old science outreach organization. We're older than the National Academies of Science, one of the oldest academies in the country. Um, most of our programs are totally free because we want them to be totally accessible to the community. Most of our programs are geared toward anywhere from sixth grade all the way up through scientists. So um, welcome to all of you. If you're not familiar with our programs, please grab some of the flyers from out front. Uh, we are um, a small organization and very mighty, but we have about 60 free science um, seminars that are held at various venues throughout the city and county and also across the, across the river, at both rivers. And um, we have a special emphasis on middle school and high school teen programs, a lot of teen leadership programs, things that are really worth looking into. So please sign up on the uh, clipboards that are going around to receive our emails if you haven't already. And this would be a great time to silence your cell phones. And a reminder that we are on Instagram and on um, Twitter, and we're at, at Academy of Sci, S-C-I, S-T-L. And I do want to mention that, um, again, a couple of things that are coming up just in the next few days. Um, on Tuesday evening, March 8th, at the Lewis and Clark branch of the St. Louis County Library, we're hosting Missouri Ozark Dinosaur Project geologist Dr. Michael Fix talking about the monster in the hollow, the story of Missouri's Ozark dinosaurs. The event is free, but you do need to register. Most of the time you don't, but in this particular case, you do need to register in advance by logging into our website, academyofsciencestl.org. And on Wednesday evening, March 9th, no need to register for this, from 7 to 8.30 at St. Joseph's Academy Performing Arts Center, we have Washington University computer science and engineering professor Dr. Victor Groove talking about a new generation of optical sensor technology based on the eyes of the mantis shrimp. This, these bio-inspired sensors are being used for early cancer detection and underwater studies in the Great Barrier Reef. Again, it's free and you don't need to register for that one. You can find more about all of our programs at academyofsciencestl.org, which is listed on the event flyers. Um, I do want to do a very special introduction for um, our speaker this evening, Dr. Um, Gautam Dantas, who received our Innovation Award from the Academy of Science at last year's um, St. Louis Outstanding Scientist Awards Dinner. And so we're thrilled, absolutely thrilled to have him with us. Um, Dr. Dantas earned his graduate degree from the University of Washington and his PhD from Harvard Medical School, where he was a research fellow in genetics He's currently an associate professor with the Department of Pathology and Immunology, the Department of Biomedical Engineering, and the Department of Molecular Myobiology, uh, Microbiology at Washington University, uh, where he also runs the Dantas Lab. The lab works at the interface of microbial genomics, ecology, synthetic biology, and systems biology to understand, harness, and engineer the biochemical processes um, potential of micro microbial communities. He's also the recipient, as I said, of our Outstanding St. Louis Scientist Innovation Award last year. And he is best known for his research on understanding and combating the evolution and exchange of antibiotic resistance amongst diverse microbial communities. Dr. Dantas uses his highly innovative experimental and comp computational approaches to make pioneering contributions to our understanding of the spread of genes conferring resistance to antibiotics in a variety of microbial community contexts. These substantial contributions are particularly timed in the global problem of drug-resistant clinical infections. He is also developing innovative new technologies to engineer improved probiotics to treat gastrointestinal disorders, as well as designing microbial catalysts to produce valued chemicals, such as biofuels. His papers have collectively been cited more than 2,500 times. His highly creative work has garnered the NIH director's new innovative award and the Breakthrough Award from the Kevin, uh, Kenneth Brainin Foundation, and we're so pleased to have him with us. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Dantas. Thank you. 
Well, thank you so much for that uh, very, very kind introduction, and thank you for being here. Uh, I suspect most of you are waiting to hear what's happening on Super Tuesday, but uh, fortunately the results won't be out for a little while, so uh, bear with me. Um, before I get going with my discussion of this topic of superbugs and antibiotic resistance, I really want to emphasize for everyone in the audience, I mean, all of you are potential scientists, that science is a team sport. Uh, and you know, when I'm lucky, I get to play manager. Most of the time, I get to play team player. Uh, and these are the wonderful people that I uh, have the pleasure of, of doing science with. Um, what I'll do is, I, as I go through, I can't highlight, uh, you wouldn't want me to highlight every one of the topics in our lab. Uh, but I'll try to highlight the folks who've, uh, uh, who've run the, uh, the major projects that I'll, I'll talk about today. Uh, and we've been very fortunate to graduate a whole cadre of young folks who've gone on to bigger and better things recently. Okay, uh, so to set the stage before we get into antibiotics, uh, I want to emphasize uh, something that maybe many of you know about, but it's, very, uh, it's worth remembering that we live on a planet dominated by microbes. We think of this as a human planet, but essentially any way you look, uh, you will find microbes. So these tiny organisms that we can't see with the living eye. Uh, and, and really, it's, it's, there's, there's almost no way you can look where you don't find uh, microbes uh, thriving. And a, a key component of uh, recognizing the diversity of functions that they encode is that they live in communities. And I'll try to keep re-emphasizing this point. It's perhaps the most important point, uh, I would say, in understanding how resistance evolves and how we might combat resistance in the future is to think about the fact that microbes don't live on their own. They're not these little domesticated beasts. They really do live in communities. Um, and because they live in communities, virtually any habitat that we can think of is part of a potential interaction network of microbes. Uh, and our goal in some of the work in our lab is to try to begin to understand whether these cartoon arrows between particular habitats matter more or less for the transmission of microbes from, say, uh, a human over to uh, a river or lake or vice versa, and how perturbations to these particular transmission events might help us understand something about uh, maintaining health in humans. Uh, now, if you think of microbiology traditionally, these are simply Google images that came up when I typed in microbiology uh, in the image search. You think of this uh, paradigm of domestication, right? You think of traditional bacteriology when we look at uh, pathogens in particular, the bugs that cause disease in us. We think about you know, streaking them out for colonies on a petri dish. Any science fair project that has microbiology has this kind of representation. You grow them up after their single colonies, isolated organisms uh, in, in these flasks, or in these test tubes. Uh, and that's well and good for a dwindling minority of microbes. Almost everywhere we've looked, if you apply traditional culture-based methods, this idea of taking microbes out of their natural habitats and bringing them into the lab, you're representing somewhere in the order of 0.1 to 1% of all microbial diversity. Uh, and what's remarkable is that we knew this since the father of microbiology studied microbes. So more than 350 years ago, Antonin uh, van Leeuwenhoek, I'm butchering his name, but he's not around to correct me, um, uh, looked at his own teeth. And he took little cultures out of his mouth and put them in water and looked at them and, and, and remarked that, they seemed that, 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 uh, that group of microbes just from his mouth was alive. It was teeming. And despite this, despite the fact that this father of microbiology recognized this 350 years ago, we forgot this lesson, and we forgot it until very recently. And rather than considering this as the ecology of microbes, we've gone to this paradigm of looking at microbes on their own. So these are traditional methods that are used to you know, take this sort of gamish of microbes from any source. Uh, and domesticating them. Uh, so you might put them on a petri dish. So there's a piece of plastic that has some kind of growth medium that selects for the particular microbe that you might care about. Uh, and then in the case of, of uh, looking at some of their functions, uh, you might uh, start subjecting them to different selections. So you know, trying to kill them with particular compounds, and I'll get to the compounds we care about quickly. Uh, in this day and age of, uh, of the DNA sequencing revolution, you might sequence the whole genome of a microorganism. So a genome of a particular organism is the collection of all of the DNA that encodes who it is. Uh, so we have a human genome just like that. Every bacterium has its own bacterial genome. And then you can go after specific genes as well using methods like PCR, which won Kerry Mullis the Nobel Prize in uh, uh, the late uh, 80s. But again, all of this is based on these culture-dependent methods. You first domesticate, uh, 
and then you study. What I'm gonna to talk to you about is this parallel idea of looking at microbes as communities using a method called metagenomics. And metagenomics, as the word uh, sort of suggests, looks at all of the genomes of all of the organisms in that community that you're studying, hence the meta component. And the way most of this occurs is in a culture-independent manner where you extract out the DNA of all of those microbes, so all of the genomes, and then you throw them onto one of these sequencing machines which reads out all of their DNA. And then you analyze. And hopefully the computational tools, the, 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 the database of information that has been built up from methods of this type can be used to decode the information in here so that hopefully you can then back calculate who the microbes were in the original community and what they might be doing. But we're here to, so that's the context that I want you to think about as we talk about uh, antibiotics and resistance. So let's step back now towards a focus on a few slides to introduce what we know that antibiotics are. So as a definition, antibiotics are small molecule chemicals that block the growth of microbes, uh, generally referring to bacteria and fungi. But the purposes of this talk going forward, I'm going to use antibiotics interchangeably with antibacterials. I'm only going to be talking about those chemicals that go after bacteria. That's not to say that the fungi are not important. Uh, many of the principles that I'll discuss are relevant to fungi as well, but I'm going to be focusing on bacteria. One thing that antibiotics and antifungals uh, and antibacterials don't do is they don't work on viruses. And this is, if you learn nothing else from this particular talk today, for yourselves and for your kids, remember this, right? And it's because we have this wanton overuse of antibiotics uh, in our clinics because we get scared when we get sick, as we might, as we should, uh, and quite often, it, uh, sort of almost irresponsibly demand antibiotics for when we have a cough or a cold, when they're doing nothing good for that viral infection. And in fact, as I'll show you, can cause a lot of collateral harm. Um, so uh, for the first sort of nerdy slide here, uh, what do antibiotics actually target? Was that, as it turns out, the reason antibiotics work, the reason these, these, these chemicals work uh, to either kill or inhibit the growth, in this case of bacteria, is because they target the most key processes of bacterial life, right? That's the reason they're so good. Uh, and so you don't need to worry about all of the details, but you know, they, they, uh, uh, some of the major antibiotic classes go after cell wall synthesis. So the cell wall is what keeps the bacterium intact. So you might imagine if you destroy the cell wall of a bacterium, it's gonna leak its guts out. It's not gonna be able to replicate, hence you've killed it. The same thing, there are many of the fundamental processes of life, of, of reading DNA and converting it into RNA, and, and taking that RNA and translating that into proteins, sort of the, the building blocks of how we think life and replication works. Antibiotics block a lot of those key processes. Now the reason I bring this up is not for you to memorize any of those particular names of processes, but to recognize that even though we think of antibiotics from a clinical perspective of going after pathogens, those few microbes that cause disease, those processes that those, those pathogens have, those disease-causing bacteria have, are in every single microbe out there. Which means, when you deploy a weapon like an antibiotic in the context of a microbial community, whether the pathogen is one in a hundred or one in a million, you are gonna be hitting every single other microbe out there. So we, these are not magic bullets, as Paul Ehrlich uh, famously called them. You need to think of them as sort of magic nuclear bombs. Um, and that's really the concept of considering antibiotics and resistance from this ecological perspective. Okay, so what do we know about the history of antibiotic use uh, and as a corollary resistance? Uh, so this fine gentleman here is Alexander Fleming. He had one of the most fantastically serendipitous discoveries in his life when he went on vacation. He happened to be looking for properties that might be antimicrobial, but I guess he maybe got fed up or because he was a Brit, he liked to take a lot of vacation. Um, and he left a couple plates out, uh, and he left his window open. And when he came back, he noticed that there were these zones of clearing uh, around the microbes that he happened to be studying, and voila, the discovery of penicillin, okay? So this happened in 1929, but it took Flory and Chain many, many years, these two other scientists, to really scale up uh, uh, Fleming's discovery, which he'd almost given up on, to have the first treatment of penicillin, the first major natural product antibiotic in 1942. And this discovery can be directly uh, linked to uh, saving a ton of soldiers in World War II. But here's the amazing thing. 1942 is the first wide-scale clinical use of penicillin. The first report of resistance to penicillin was in 1929. 
Now this, at this point, might surprise some of you. I hope by the end of my talk it doesn't surprise you at all. And I'll try to say this over and over again. Antibiotic resistance is a natural feature of every microbial ecosystem. It is not something we invent. It's something that we give selection pressure to take naturally occurring functions to enrich. Okay? And I'll try to convince you of that fact beyond just this observation. Uh, but there, you know, there are these natural product antibiotics, and the majority of the, the compounds we use in the clinic as antibiotics are indeed natural products. Uh, but there are also a few uh, compounds that are uh, made by a really smart organic chemist, and Gerard Domak was one of these. He worked in the German dye industry, um, and uh, uh, he discovered the sulfonamides as these dye derivatives, which would also be used as antibiotics. We still use some of the sulfonamides uh, uh, in the clinic, uh, uh, sulfamethoxazole, for instance. It's a synthetic compound, first treatment in 1935, first report of resistance in 1939. And this is just the first clinical report of resistance. There's a lot of data to suggest that this, this clearly predated any human use. Okay. And uh, this sort of summarizes that particular story for every class of antibiotics we know. So this is a timeline that shows all of these major antibiotics across this axis is time. Uh, uh, it starts out in blue. That's the period of time when the antibiotic is deployed when resistance is not found. When it transitions to red is when antibiotic is seen in the clinic. And as you can see, there are no antibiotics on this particular map for which there isn't a transition to red. Another way of stating the data on this particular slide is as far as pathogens are concerned, based on what we've learned so far, antibiotic resistance is not a question of if, it's only a matter of when, right? There is no such thing as an irresistible antibiotic as far as pathogens are concerned. Okay. So where does that bring us? It brings us to what I would claim is a precipice. There are many people who claim now that we might be either entering or are in a post-antibiotic era, which is exceptionally scary. Uh, and I'll give you numbers to suggest why I'm scared by it, at least. Uh, in the US uh, uh, alone, there are about 20,000, 25,000 people killed by drug-resistant bacteria. You scale that number up to the rest of the world, at a minimum, it's in the hundreds of thousands, if not the millions. There have been a bunch of projection reports to say, how bad is this problem going to get if we don't do something about it? And by 2050, that number of annual deaths around the world is estimated at a lower bound to be 10 million people. 10 million people killed by infections because we don't have antibiotics to treat them. And what does that cost us? It costs us a lot. Right now, the cost of drug-resistant infections to the US economy both in direct as well as indirect healthcare costs, and when I say indirect, I mean things like uh, not being able to go to work because you're sick, is $55 billion. Scaled up uh, by 2050, cumulatively, the hit to the global economy is $100 trillion. Now, I'm sure, like me, most of you don't know what $100 trillion is in terms of something that we could buy. Perhaps Donald Trump might. Um, uh, but to give you some perspective, $100 trillion the GDP of the United States is about 16 to 17 trillion dollars. If we were to lose this much from the global economy, that would be equivalent to taking the last six years of everything of value that the US has produced and wiping it out. That's the cost of drug resistant infections. And unfortunately for us, this is happening at exactly the wrong time from the perspective of finding new compounds, right? So here's a chart, uh, it's, a, it's a busy chart, but what I want you to notice is Here's a timeline that roughly represents the last 15 to 20 years. Uh, here are the persist, uh, percentage of antibiotic-resistant infections. And here are three uh, sort of major players. And you'll see some of these again. You don't need to worry about the acronyms. They represent drug-resistant bug. And you'll see all of these are increasing. And then there's, here's this line. This is the line that represents the number of companies doing research uh, on antibiotics, on new antibiotics, trying to treat those compounds. And most people would argue, you want those trends to be in exactly the opposite direction, right? So this is considered this idea of this perfect storm. Exactly when we need new antibiotics, we don't have them. Okay, so if you were to think about, you know, here's a, a pathogen, um, and it sees an antibiotic, how does it become resistant to that antibiotic? How does it acquire this property where it can no longer be treated, no longer be killed by the antibiotic? And here's a possible way, way in which it occurs. You've got lots of these germs. The CDC likes using that term. I'm not a big fan of it, but, um, but bugs, germs, microbes. 
Um, and just by natural variation, in some microbial ecology, in a community of microbes, a few microbes might be naturally resistant, just because of genetic variation in the population. You now hit that particular population with an antibiotic, what do you think is going to happen? The ones that are susceptible, the ones that are normally going to be killed, will get wiped out. It'll give a lot of selection pressure for the resistant ones to get enriched. And sure enough, this kind of shows you that picture, right? What might be a minority resistant population is now a majority resistant population. And then microbes can do something which is remarkable, something that we can't do, or sometimes wish we could do, which is do this thing called horizontal gene transfer. Um, just schematized on this side. So this is the process that you're probably familiar with in terms of evolution. You give birth to your progeny, and they go birth to their progeny, and you can pass traits on, right? Microbes do the same thing. They can divide, and then you might have you know, some random member that happens to be resistant, and it gets selected. Horizontal gene transfer, as I just mentioned, is a different process. So this is a vertical transfer of genes. Horizontal gene transfer refers to this process where microbes can move genetic material from one cell to another cell very, very easily. And by moving that DNA from one cell to another, sometimes in very, very large chunks, you can move functions, you can move properties. Now think about what that might mean from a human or an animal perspective. That would mean over the course of a doubling time, that is the growth rate of a microbe, which is about 20 to 30 minutes, if we could do this, within 20 to 30 minutes, we could interact with, say, a banana or a strawberry and suddenly smell a lot sweeter because we just picked up the gene that those particular uh, fruits have to have that property to make us smell sweet. And we know that doesn't happen, right? Uh, so, and, and what's amazing about this is that microbes much more distant from each other than we are from a banana can do this on very, very short timescales. And that is what exacerbates the antibiotic resistance problem. And so there's a lot of research that's been shown that if you look at clinical pathogens, the things that we're worried about, the things that we want to kill with antibiotics, they happen to be adept at these processes of grabbing DNA from other microbes, for, of donating DNA from other microbes, and some of the really strange ones can grab naked DNA from out in the environment, right? Uh, so as an aside, there happens to be this microbe called Acinetobacter. Back in the days of the Iraq War, uh, it was dubbed Iraqi bacter. Uh, and the reason is because that particular microbe has this insane ability to pick up genes from, from, from the environment. Uh, and it was, it was getting into wound infections when, when uh, our service members got blast wounds. And this bug had just uh, been sort of a grab back collector of antibiotic resistance genes through this process of uh, uh, horizontal gene transfer. Okay, so that's something to keep in mind. This is why we care about the ecology of microbial transmission of resistance genes. This might possibly a, a, be a simple thing to work on, right? If you only worried about it passing from one bug uh, that was related to the next bug over and over. With this in play, any microbe in any microbial ecology, which is how all microbes live, can now suddenly donate resistance genes, and maybe lots of resistance in genes in one step. Okay, so I mentioned to you earlier that um, there's a lot of work out there that shows that traditional methods, tr traditional culture-based methods, this idea of domesticating microbes in our labs, represents a dwindling minority of microbes on our planet. And this is true for really any habitat we look at, whether it's the soil or our own human bodies or animal bodies or water systems. Um, and here are just a couple of estimates and ways in which they've, they've made these estimates. They've used molecular methods. So this is by sequencing DNA and saying how much of that DNA comes from microbes we've seen versus ones we haven't seen. And you can also do it by simple microscopy. Back in the 80s, we knew this idea. There was this famous experiment called the Staley and Konopka experiment, where they did a very, very simple thing. They took on my, an environmental sample. They did the traditional culturing method. That is, they took it. They put it on petri dishes and counted the number of colonies that came up. And then they look at the number of living cells under a microscope, right? Microbiology, microscope. And they found that the number of living cells that they could count under the microscope were hundreds to thousand times as many as the ones that you would estimate on a petri dish. Really clearly showing before any of the fancy molecular methods that we were vastly undercounting microbes in natural ecosystems. And unfortunately, as I'll tell you today, this bias towards culture of underestimating bacteria directly leads to underestimating their functions. And one of their functions is antibiotic resistance, right? And we've seen over, uh, over and over again, and a lot of other people have shown this too, that if we first apply this cultural bottleneck, right, this idea of domesticating microbes, the genes we see are the same. We're looking at this tiny, tiny fraction of the, of the known world. 
When we look at those same samples, whether we look at fecal samples from humans, which represent the microbes in, those, in their guts, or we look at microbes from soils, and look at the same samples using the same methods, but now don't apply the culture bias, you find the same types of resistance genes, the same functions, they're able to knock out the same antibiotics, but they're novel, they've never been seen before. Okay. So let's, let's, let's step back and think about what are the methods that are available to us now to learn more about antibiotic resistance. And here I'm focusing again on antibiotic resistance genes, the pieces of DNA that encode some protein which is going to break down or, or, or somehow inactivate the, the antibiotic, right? So uh, uh, in this day and age, uh, if you're a good scientist, you have to name your own ohm, right? You've heard of the genome, the metagenome, so we get to name our own resistome. Uh, and that is simply referring to the entire collection of antibiotic resistance genes in a particular ecosystem, right? In a, in a, uh, in a, uh, in a test tube, in a soil sample. All of the resistance genes, the resistome. And I'll use this resistome term over and over again. Okay, so let's assume we want to, to, to represent this little circle as the resistome of any particular microbial community. So a group of microbes in say, a human gut. What can we do to interrogate those genes? Well, the first thing we can do is culture up as many bugs as we can, and we can phenotype those bugs, those bacteria. And what I mean by phenotyping is testing their function. I can grow that particular bacterium up, subject that bacterium to a certain concentration of an antibiotic, if it grows at that concentration, it's resistant to it. If it dies, it's susceptible, right? I can do that. But as I've just told you, that's only gonna give you 0.1 to 1% of microbes using uh, most, uh, most estimates, most ecosystems. So the resistance genes that come from there are a tiny part of the potential pie. But we live in this era of exceptionally cheap DNA sequencing, right? You can take all of that DNA from that original sample, don't worry about the culturing, sequence all of it, now it's very, very cheap. Um, and make some predictions based on that DNA sequence, looking at, say, a database of known resistance genes and say, what does this DNA look like? Does it look like a resistance gene? Well, I'm going to call it a resistance gene then. And this allows us to potentially complement the cultured with the not cultured. So maybe you've got all of the pie, right? Well, here's the problem. All you can do with this data is rely on what you already know. If I see a piece of DNA I've never seen before, how am I going to assign it a particular function if it's not related to something that I, uh, that, that I don't know? So this allows me to maybe expand out to more microbes that look like microbes I've seen before. But therein lies the conundrum, right? If we've only looked at 1% of the microbes, what about the other 99%? What if their sequences are very different? So our lab has spent quite a bit of time developing a particular technology or actually improving it. Uh, and it's going to get into a little bit of detail. And I'll try to gloss over some of the really nitty gritty details. But it's, uh, it's worth mentioning because it really changed what we're able to do in this field. And it's a method called functional metagenomics. And what it recognizes is that we have the ability now to take DNA from any arbitrary source and force it to make the proteins that are encoded on it. And if I do that in the context of a microbe, if I take that DNA and force it into using this horizontal gene transfer idea, if I force it into a microbe that is susceptible, and it turns that microbe resistant, I've now identified a new resistance gene. And that's the entire part, point behind functional metagenomics. The next couple slides are for some of the more sciencey aficionados who might care about some of those details. So what it really does is that, that, that if you skip the next two slides, what functional metagenomics selections allow you to do is transcend this known culture barrier. It allows you to say, can I fill in this part of the pie of brand new resistance genes, even if I've never seen that resistance gene before? Okay, so how do you do it? You go out and you extract all of the DNA, all of the microbial DNA from a sample. So in the lab, what that means is you take a soil sample or an icky fecal sample uh, and you crush it up and you extract all of the microbes and you extract and purify the DNA, okay? And then what you do is you break it down into small pieces and then you do what's called an expression experiment. So you, you clone it in, this is recombinant DNA, and you do what I told you about earlier. You force those random chunks of DNA to, to express a particular function in a bacterium that's easy to work with. So these are one of the workhorses in the lab. Many of you have probably heard of E. coli. Uh, not the E. coli that made you sick from Jack in the Box, but this is the E. coli that's safe and good to work with in the lab. Um, and what you now have is a library, right? So you have this, this cell, uh, it's a domesticated cell. You're treating it like a chassis, like, a, uh, uh, like an engine that'll do something for you, right? And what you're making each of these cells do 
is force them to express a function encoded on one of these random pieces of DNA. And now you use culture to your advantage. You take this library and you pop it onto one of these Petri dishes. One of these Petri dishes has antibiotics on it, which would kill the untransformed E. coli, the naked E. coli, the E. coli that doesn't have one of these chunks of DNA. So I said the only things that will survive now, the only things that will grow in the presence of that antibiotic is an E. coli cell, which happened to have picked up an antibiotic resistance gene. And then, of course, you have a, a few more details in terms of sequencing that DNA and figuring out what it is. But here's the punchline. You can, at the very end of this experiment, get a, a very well cataloged list of functional antibiotic resistance genes, which came from this particular microbial community without having any idea whatsoever up front what those genes were. It's a method for identifying new resistance genes and also old resistance genes. Um, okay. Now, this is an even busier slide, uh, and all I want to make the point uh, is to say that method was developed by Joe Handelsman and colleagues in the late uh, 1990s. Joe Handelsman now is in uh, President Obama's Office of Science and Technology, advising them on science policy, uh, uh, and then we'll go back to Yale at the end of the presidency. What we did uh, while Dr. Handelsman was doing much bigger things was we took that method and we reduced that method that she developed in terms of cost by a hundredfold. By reducing the cost of that method by a hundredfold, for the same dollar amount, you can now do a hundred times as many experiments. And that is what we've been able to use to start comparing microbial habitats. Again, the details are here, we've published on it. The main point for those of you who might care is, we took this engine, which is the part that gives you the genes, and married it to one of these high throughput next generation sequencing instruments, right? This idea that you can sequence lots and lots and lots of DNA for much cheaper. And then we took that and we married it to some, some computational methods to make better predictions about resistance. But again, you don't need to worry about the details in terms of what it can actually give you. Again, you start out with microbial DNA from any habitat. Uh, it could even be cultured microbes, for instance. And in the end, you get a nice catalog of functional antibiotic resistance genes. Okay, this is a good time to remind ourselves about why might we be, want to look at uh, resistance genes in other places, right? Uh, in, in habitats beyond, say, a hospital environment. And I like this particular quote from uh, Tom Frieden, the director of the CDC from a few years ago. Uh, and, and remember, this is, this, is the, this is our champion protecting us against infectious diseases. And here he is a couple of years ago basically claiming that we really don't know a lot about antibiotic resistance because it's evolving at an alarming rate, because it can move it across barriers, across borders, and we really, really need to do new things to understand uh, how these resistance genes are moving around. Now, take, take that from the context of what I just told you about, which is to say, here's the director for CDC, and until the method I just told you about, he was looking at a tiny, tiny fraction of known resistance genes. So the problem is even bigger than what we recognize in the clinic. Okay, so I'm going to flash up this image again. You saw a version of this earlier. This is sort of a network diagram of different habitats that one might claim is important for microbial transmission and for the movement of antibiotic resistance genes. From a clinical perspective, this is not something you usually think of when you think of antibiotic resistance. You think of, I go into the clinic because I'm sick. Some clinician happens to look at the super bug that might be infecting me. We treat it, and if there's a transmission event, it's probably in the hospital or maybe between me and someone who was sick before me. We don't necessarily think of all of these other habitats. I'll try to give you a couple examples to suggest that we really need to start thinking about these other habitats. Okay? And I'll start with humans. I'll start with the commensal microbiota, as it's called, these largely good bugs that live in and on our bodies. They're, in fact, critical for many of the functions that we have. I'll first discuss why they're important, potentially, in this resistance exchange network. And then I'll end uh, in this ecology side with the soil which again might not seem obvious in terms of a resistance gene exchange network, but hopefully I'll convince you that it is. Okay, so humans. The very first experiment that we did to see whether this methodology, this functional metagenomics to look for cryptic new resistance genes was going to show us anything was done a few years ago when I was a postdoc. Um, we went to two individuals uh, under IRB approval, collected fecal samples from them, made sure that they were unrelated and they were healthy. So why look at their fecal samples? Because they contain or they represent most of the microbes that are inside the human gut. And we did one additional thing. We made sure to, to test them or to ask them at least whether they'd had any antibiotics for the past year. 
and they claimed that they had it. So why do this? We did this because we wanted to understand, are there bugs in the human gut, in the healthy human gut, that are carrying resistance genes without antibiotic therapy? Is there a baseline level of antibiotic resistance in even our good bugs? So we did that first using this culture method because that's the sort of, uh, you know, the traditional bar that we have to compare ourselves to. So in fact, we cultured up uh, samples uh, uh, on petri dishes from these fecal samples. This was not a great set of days to be in the lab around us. Um, uh, and uh, it does stink from any, no matter whether they're healthy or not. Um, and then we phenotype them. We check each of those microbes, 600 bacteria that we cultured out to see what their resistance profile might be against a whole suite of clinical antibiotics. And we were pretty surprised. So these bars represent, uh, the orange bars is individual one, the blue bars are individual two. And across this axis, we're saying, out of all of the microbes from that individual, what percentage were resistant to any one of these antibiotics? And you can see, they're resistant to a ton of antibiotics. Some of them pan-resistant. 100% of the bacteria that we tested were resistant to this particular antibiotic. Fortunately, an antibiotic that we don't use a lot in the clinic right now. Um, Okay, so a lot of phenotypic resistance, right? But I've just told you, we care about, this, this represents this, this minority. Uh, in the human gut, if you use these culturing methods, you're representing, again, 0.1 to 1%. So what about that 99%, right? What, uh, uh, what do the rest of the microbes look like? So we took that method that I just mentioned and applied it to the same fecal samples that these bacteria were cultured out of. But then we did two things, right? We did it on the fecal sample, so those are the cultured, uh, uh, the uncultured majority but we also apply the same method to the collection of DNA that was in the cultured set. So now we can do a direct comparison. What did the resistance genes look like in these bacteria that we know are resistant? And what do these resistance genes look like in the bacteria that are not cultured? Okay? And here's what we found that was startling to us at the time. So here's the data for the 100 or so resistance genes, 100 resistance genes from these 600 bacteria uh, that came after culturing. And what you're seeing here is uh, um, a percentage identity, so this is comparing those genes to all genes that have been seen before uh, in some database. And what we find is, as we might expect, almost all of these genes that came from the cultured set had been seen before. But here was the weird thing, about 80% of those genes, so 80 of the 100 genes, were exactly the same as they had been seen in pathogens. So beginning to draw this linkage between the good bugs and the bad bugs. Okay? But then when we looked at the genes that came out of this, this uncultured, this culture-independent sampling, this metagenomic sampling, we saw the same approximate number of genes, about 100 or so genes. But they were genes we had never seen before. Their average identity uh, was 40 to 50%. So uh, what that really means is those genes have really never been seen before in terms of anything that's in our databases. And really what that did was emphasize this severe undersampling of the good bugs in the body uh, in terms of resistance because of this culture bias. Okay, so, uh, yeah, I know. I, 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 you can't find out whose kid that is, surprisingly, on the internet. Um, so we decided at that point, I was starting off my lab here at WashU, and said, goodness, if these two <laughs> adults have a lot of resistance genes uh, in their guts, uh, and they're healthy, where does this resistance come from? And the next couple stories tries to address that question in a couple, couple different ways. Where does resistance in a healthy gut come from? So one of the things to do then is to start at that sort of time zero, right? Think about our kids. So we've, we've learned over time that most of our kids are born sterile. So when they enter the world, uh, they don't have any microbes associated with them on their skins or in their guts. And then they're this naked petri dish. They attract every microbe on the, uh, on the planet, right? And if you have kids, know that because of what our kids do. Um, and we find that, in fact, they, they get their microbes from exactly what you would you'd imagine. They get them for their primary caregivers and their moms, their dads, their dogs, their cats, their floors, right? Uh, and there's been lots of lots of exciting research in this, in this field of metagenomics, of sequencing DNA, to show that there's a lot of dynamics, a lot of instability in the, in the infant gut during the first few years of life. So that is to say, the architecture of the microbes, the ecology, the type of microbes that get into the gut are jumping around and fluctuating during, say, roughly the first three years of life. And then, miraculously, it stabilizes. And it appears that after about age three or four, the type, the, the, the composition, the diversity of microbes that are in the human gut stay persistent for the rest of your life, right? So that is to say, between zero and one, between one and two, between one and three, a lot of change, and after that, it's quasi-stable. Now, why do I make that 
important point for this uh, discussion of antibiotic resistance, because if you now look in the United States at the five-year age bin where we dump the most antibiotics into any group, it's in the zero to five age bin, right? So think about what I'm saying. Here's a developing ecosystem. Think about a naked forest with animals coming in, right? And just beginning to establish plants coming in. Same thing with our guts. And during that time is when we try to firebomb that particular forest as many times as we possibly can. And now there's a lot of good retrospective analysis to say a lot of that antibiotic use in our children is unwarranted. We find that out by basically tracking did we give antibiotics and then what did that kid have? And in many, many times, they've had a viral infection. So developing ecosystem, we're hurting it, we're perturbing it with antibiotics. Most of the time, or a lot of the time, it's not a good idea, okay? So we decided this was where we would focus. We would look at developing infants and children and their moms and look at them over time and look for cohorts of kids, most of them here in Missouri at Children's Hospital or at MOBAP, where we could get fecal samples and begin to understand how are those microbial compositions developing with and without antibiotics and what were the antibiotics doing to them, right? A sort of basic question. And our, again, our argument was if we made changes or if, if doctors and parents were making those changes in their kids, once they got beyond age three, you've now set all of those resistance genes there for the rest of your life. Okay. Um, and uh, yeah, we, we haven't done this experiment yet and we don't plan to, um, but I'm a cute kid. Um, so, M.A. Moore uh, is an instructor in neonatology in my lab, and she took on this heroic project a few years ago to say, that technology that I described, could you actually apply it at scale, right? Could you now apply this functional metagenomics, this, this hunting for new resistance genes against lots and lots of samples? So at that time, we really didn't have access to uh, cohorts here at WashU, so we were able to, uh, with, with a pediatrician colleague here, Phil Tarr, we had access to fecal samples that had been collected from kids in Seattle in the early 2000s, okay? About 20 kids uh, across an age range. So across this particular x-axis, you see the, uh, the ages of all of those kids that were sampled. And you have a, a lot of really, really young kids. In fact, a quarter of these kids are under two years of age. Some really, really young, zero to three month olds. And then all the way up to adolescence. Um, and what MA did was she took those fecal samples, made these libraries to look for these resistance genes, against this panel of antibiotics. You don't need to worry anything about the colors and the shading or anything from this plot. All I want to take you to take away from this plot is anywhere you see a color is a combination between a kid's fecal sample and a resistance gene against that particular antibiotic. The only time a resistance gene is not found is when it's white. And as you can see, this is a fairly colored plot. Right? That is to say, these kids, healthy kids, they were from an outpatient clinic. There was nothing wrong with them. Most of them had not had antibiotics for three months at least are full of antibiotic resistant bacteria, okay? And also you can see hopefully, at least just visually without any statistics, that that doesn't seem to be much of a difference in terms of the kids who are really young and the kids who are really old. Put another way, and we've now proven this over and over again, our kids are inoculated with antibiotic resistant bacteria. It doesn't necessarily start with this, this blank slate. The bugs that come in and, 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 and invade into the gut and into the skin and, and everywhere else, right, all of those bacteria carry resistance genes. That means you're starting out with, with, uh, with uh, already an environment that could then enrich when antibiotics are used. Okay. Uh, this is a busy slide and I don't want to go through all of it. I just want to make one specific point here. So this is a slide again that says for the kids that we have, right, the 20 or so kids, for any one of these antibiotics, what percentage of those kids had resistance genes against that antibiotic? The most of these antibiotics don't, probably don't mean anything to you, but I want you to focus on two antibiotics tetracycline and tigercycline. Tetracycline happens to be one of these really old antibiotics. In fact, one of the major tetracyclines, oxytetracycline, was, uh, was discovered in a field at Mizzou, a natural product, okay? Uh, it's used in, it's still used in the clinic, it's used in agriculture, it's used in aquaculture, it's used all over the place. So perhaps not all that surprising that every one of our kids had resistance to this particular antibiotic. And the reason you see these triplets in terms of the histograms is they're just breaking the data down into the kids who are less than a year of age, the kids are over a year of age, and the third bar is all of the kids. So obviously, if all of the kids are resistant, you'll see 100%. Tiger cycling. Tiger cycling is one of these new drugs, right? It's one of the few new antibiotics that's come to the market in the last 10 or 15 years. It's in the same class as tetracycline, but some fancy organic chemists went and changed it and made it more powerful, okay? 
So great news, right? Way fewer kids have resistance to tiger cycling. But here's the problem. These are all US kids. Tiger cycling was approved for use in the US in 2005. These kids were sampled in 2003. We have at least a handful of kids in this cohort that are resistant to a late generation antibiotic that have never seen that drug. And again, this is the second time I'll emphasize that point. Antibiotic resistance is a natural feature of bacteria. We don't invent it. We just give it lots of reasons to amplify from existing pools. Okay? Uh, the other thing that I'll point out is there was only a single antibiotic for which we saw any difference between the young kids and the old kids. Again, emphasizing even in the zero to three month old babies, you're seeing just as much resistance to a lot of different antibiotics in their healthy gut microbiota uh, as any of the 18 or 19 year olds. Okay? All right. MA has now followed up the study with a twin cohort here in Missouri. Um, uh, again, born here either at Children's Hospital or at MOBAP. Uh, in this case, we tried to do longitudinal sampling. I won't go through all of the details, just to say that we tried to, in this particular study, look for kids because they're twins, right? They're genetically identical in terms of their human genomes. We tried to look at kids who had never seen any antibiotics. We tried to see kids who were discordant. So one kid got sick and the other one didn't. So they got an antibiotic. And then kids who were concordant for the same antibiotic. They both got sick, they both got the same antibiotic. Uh, and so we, we, we profiled the antibiotic resistance genes before and after these treatments. Um, interestingly, we didn't really see much of a long-term impact of that antibiotic. That is to say, there was so much antibiotic resistance there that we didn't see large changes in levels of the particular resistance genes. But what we did see, what we did confirm, and again, you don't need to worry about the actual representation of the data, is we found what you might expect when you have relatedness, right? These kids have their same genomes, but perhaps more importantly, they're sharing the same environment. These kids are living with the same caregivers. And so we find that the twins, no matter what they'd been perturbed with, had, uh, were much more similar to each other in terms of the resistance genes that they had than they were to any other kid, or they were even that to, they were to their moms. And so the global point to make here is that the environment matters, right? What environment we're in, uh, what inoculation we get, the type of bugs that come into us, may be even more important than the specific antibiotic therapies we have. The antibiotic therapies might go in and change levels, but really it matters who we're around, okay? okay. So, I, so far I've been telling you about all of these particular populations, these humans who are adults, or humans who are uh, little babies, um, who've lived in an antibiotic era, right? We've used antibiotics for about 80 years as a human population. So when I want to ask the question, where does antibiotic resistance come from? That's really hard to do in this day and age, right? Everyone has seen antibiotics. Even if you think you've never had an antibiotic, you've probably eaten something that was treated with antibiotics. Your parents probably had antibiotics. The environment that you're in, in most of the world, has some antibiotics around. So what if we wanted to look at this picture, where antibiotic is a perturber to this ecosystem, and remove it? Now, we don't have a time machine. We can't go back to the era before antibiotics. But perhaps we might be able to find a remote population on this planet that hasn't seen antibiotics. And we were very, very fortunate to get access to exactly such a population in collaboration. This is a group of Yanomami Indians of Venezuela. So through our collaborators, uh, lots of collaborators across uh, uh, the US as well as Puerto Rico and Venezuela, we managed to get access to fecal, oral, and skin swabs from this tribe at first contact. So this is a Venezuelan uh, medical mission that did a helicopter flyby initially and then went in with a, with a, a, a Yanomami uh, tribe person from another tribe that had been contacted and they went through with the anthropologists to uh, uh, make contact. How after making contact they convinced these people to immediately give them fecal, oral, and skin samples is beyond me. I was not involved with this. I imagine this is what the first alien contact is gonna be like. There's gonna be a microbial sampling. Uh, but again, we just got access to the samples and we asked this very specific question. Now we had an amazing opportunity to look at antibiotic resistance from potentially the pre-antibiotic era. Because from all of the data we got from these people, from their oral histories, they had never seen antibiotics before. So what did their guts look like? What did their skin and oral samples look like? So Erica Pearson, a recent graduate in genomics uh, uh, from my lab, uh, analyzed a few of these samples. And again, I won't go through all of the data, but again, all I want you to notice here is the same type of representation as an MAZE data. Uh, you've got just the axes swapped, now you've got the, the individuals here, four individuals, 
their fecal, fecal and oral microbiota, and profiled against a variety of antibiotics. And everywhere you see red is where we find resistance genes. So from this small group of individuals, from this sampling, we identified 30 functional antibiotic resistance genes. Now, I've been telling you over and over again that you know, resistance is this ancient feature of microbes. So perhaps you might expect that there'll be some resistance genes, right? Now, I'll repeat this in the next section, but something to keep in mind is the things that we call antibiotics that I've been talking to you about so far, right? These small molecule chemicals that we use in our clinics, most of them are discovered as natural products. Most of them are discovered as things that bacteria in the soil make that between the 1940s and 1960s, a bunch of people went out into those soils, cultured up these special type of bacteria and found out that they made these amazing small molecules which would kill pathogens. That's what we call antibiotics, right? So it makes sense that if you've got all of this production in natural environments, you'll find resistance to natural compounds. So in fact, we went in hypothesizing that even in this remote community, we would find resistance genes, but they would be to natural antibiotics. And sure enough, we found resistance to natural antibiotics, but we found a couple other scary things. We found a number of examples of resistance genes in these untouched, in these antibiotic naive individuals that were resistant to the latest generation antibiotics, okay? Here's one example. Uh, again, you don't need to worry about the specific details. All you can, uh, uh, can take away is that this single gene from one of these individuals, in this case from fecal sample from one of these individuals, is resistant to the latest generation, uh, so fifth generation antibiotics, some of them, uh, uh, fourth and fifth generation cephalosporins, for instance. Put this another way. If you were to see this gene in a human in the clinic now, you'd freak out because you'd have to now look for new drugs to treat that person. Here's a healthy person who's never seen antibiotics, and one of their fecal bacteria carries one of these resistance genes. Same story in the oral microbiota. And just an example of another gene. Uh, again, resistance to some really hardcore late generation drugs uh, and, and, and related to many things we've seen uh, uh, in the clinic now. So what does this tell us? Again, it tells us that humans were carrying these resistance genes around in our good bacteria well before antibiotics came on the scene. But then over the last 80 years, we've hit all of those ecosystems with antibiotics and given lots of opportunity for selection and exchange and for this process of horizontal gene transfer. And so the, 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 the underlying paradigm here is we need to worry about our antibiotic use because if a pathogen comes in and it happens to be susceptible, that is it happens to be able to succumb to an antibiotic, all it needs to do when it enters the human body is interact with one of these good guys. And through horizontal gene transfer in a single step, it can acquire an antibiotic resistance gene. At, that's the end of that therapy. Okay, so that's what I'll, I'll, that's, I'll, that'll be my end talking about humans for now. And I'll switch to a, an ecology or habitat that may not be quite as obvious in terms of the discussion on antibiotics, though hopefully you see where I'm going when I talked about where uh, antibiotics come from, and that's the soil, okay? So why look at resistance in the soil? But well, there's actually a pretty good, uh, rich, robust literature about the soil resistor. Again, I'm using that term, the collection of antibiotic resistance genes in bacteria that live in soil environments. And I'll give you three pieces of pretty spectacular data that brought us to why we uh, embarked on this journey of looking for the soil resistor. One was this remarkable study from 2011 where a group of Canadian researchers went into the Beringian permafrost, this permafrost in Canada, and they took cores, cores from the permafrost that they were able to carbon date to be 30,000 years old. Right? And then from those cores, they sequenced the microbial DNA. They made sure to check for contamination, et cetera. And when they sequenced those 30,000-year-old cores, they found resistance to modern antibiotics. Very clearly establishing now genetic evidence for the fact that antibiotic resistance is, was around in soil microbes well before we came on the scene in terms of using our antibiotics. Antibiotic resistance is ancient. In fact, that's the name of their paper. Okay. The other critical piece of information about why the resistance should be considered in the soil comes from now an over 40-year-old hypothesis put forward by a grandfather in the field, Julian Davies, who put forward what he calls the producer hypothesis. So I just told you about this a little bit ago. It's this idea that almost all of the things that we use as antibiotics in the clinic are natural products. They're made by this very special group of bacteria in the soil, the streptomyces of the actinomyces genus. You don't have to worry about the name. One thing to remember about these special bugs is you think of the smell of the soil after a nice rainy day. That smell comes from the molecules, some of the many molecules that these particular bugs make. 
So they, they make soil smell nice and they also gave us our antibiotics. So what did Julian put forward in the producer hypothesis? He uh, uh, posited that there's an ability to date how old this production capacity is and those, there's this ability to produce antibiotics in the soil by bacteria is dated to millions to billions of years ago. So bacteria have been in the soil for, you know, or, or I should say antibiotic resistant, uh, antibiotic production in the soil is almost as old as bacteria in the soil. And so his hypothesis was, if these bacteria are making these compounds, they must have self-immunity. They must resist those compounds. Because what I told you in the very, very beginning, those compounds target very key cellular processes. So let me restate that. If these producers are in the soil and they're not committing suicide, they must have resistance genes, which basically puts forward the producer hypothesis that the soil is the, is the origin of all antibiotic resistance because it's the origin of all antibiotics. And in fact, because it's been millions of years, all of their neighbors are not dying either, and so they're through horizontal gene transfer, probably depositing these genes in their neighbors too. So resistance is ancient in the soil, and it kind of makes sense. And here's where it comes to us as humans come chugging along and make a big difference, right? Uh, not a good difference in this case. So these are archival soils from Europe, 70 years worth of soils taken from the same spots uh, over the era of antibiotic use. And then there are methods used to measure antibiotic resistance genes. And you can see all of these important genes go up. Okay, so resistance is ancient, it makes sense, and it's going up because probably things that we're doing. So that should suggest that if pathogens got all of their genes from these soil bugs, they should have the same genes, right? We should be able to track those genes to soil bugs. But as it turns out, when we, people looked for resistance in the soil for decades, most of the genes they found in soil bacteria were different. They're not the type of genes that we see in pathogens, which pose the conundrum, right? Can we now begin to consider, is the soil more than just the original origin, right? Because if, if resistance came from the soil and happened millions of years ago, we don't really care from a clinical perspective. But if there are soil bugs there right now that are part of the exchange network, we care. Because that might change how clinical uh, antibiotic use might enhance some of those transfers. So our lab decided that this was because of a lack of methodology, because of a lack of technology, and there, were such there was evidence of recent transfer, and then we'd go hunting for it. So to do that, to look for such exchange of recent uh, transfer between resistance in the soil and pathogens, we harnessed a really strange experiment that again that I performed in my postdoc, where we tried to look for exceptionally drug resistant microbes. So we went to 11 different soils across the US from Minnesota, from Pennsylvania, and from Massachusetts with different amounts of human impact. And we actually ran a culturing experiment. We took these guys and we, we domesticated them. But we domesticated them under a pretty bizarre scenario. We said, we're gonna give you media, and, we're, and the only food source we're gonna give you is an antibiotic. Which means not only do you need to be resistant to this antibiotic, you need to be able to eat it. But one more thing, we're gonna give it to you at concentrations that is gonna crystallize in human blood. An exceptionally high concentration of antibiotic. 50 times the concentration of antibiotic uh, that you would use in the clinic. And why do this? Because we thought we'd be smart about this and be able to only look at a few microbes and follow up on them. Microbes are sort of evolutionally smarter than we are, and in this 11 by 18 test, 18 antibiotics and 11 soils, we got hundreds of bacteria out of the soil that could eat these antibiotics for breakfast, okay? So that was a separate study. Um, we decided uh, that maybe this weird enriched set of ultra drug resistant microbes might be that missing link. They might be the ones that have the ability to transfer resistance genes, or at least have evidence of resistance genes transferred between the soil and the clinic. And there's one other reason for this, again, for the microbiologists here, and that is that the growth conditions we used here happen to enrich with the type of bacteria that we find growing on hospital surfaces. Okay, these nosocomial or hospital-acquired infections, uh, Acinetobacter, Pseudomonas, Klebsiella, it just happens to be that those guys come up in these selections too. So, we took a representative set of these particular weirdo bugs, about 100 or so cultures, and said, what are your genes? What are your resistance genes? And Kevin Forsberg and Alejandro Reyes, again, two recent graduate students from WashU, applied, again, the same methodology that I've been telling you about to look at the functional resistance genes here. And, unfortunately, in some ways, we found exactly what we were looking for. We found nine different resistance genes from these soil bacteria, non-pathogenic, so non-disease-causing soil bacteria, that were exactly the same as genes that had been found in disease-causing organisms before. 
Okay, again, lots of details here, but one of the things that I want you to take away, between these 10 genes, uh, or nine genes, they're able to knock out five classes of antibiotics. Not five antibiotic compounds, five classes of antibiotics. They represent all of the resistance mechanisms that we know that pathogens use. Between those nine guys, right, every known mechanism of resistance. And here's the important part. Remember that these particular soil bugs came from the US, from three, three random states in the US. Um, and yet the pathogens that they were identical to from all around the planet, right? When we looked at who had deposited those sequences from pathogens, they were from India and from Russia and from China and from Brazil and from Australia, all over the place. So this suggests that we happen to stumble across these transfer events that represent global dissemination of these resistance genes, okay? And this busy slide is perhaps the scariest thing that we found, okay? So what do, I mean, again, lots and lots of words and colors here. Let's focus on what I think is the important part. Down here, these little bars represent a gene that we've identified. Anything in red is a resistance gene. Across the bottom, those genes happen to come from the soil selections we did. And we now compare those genes to genomes of pathogens, the ones that are causing diseases. And if you see these gray bars, they're exactly the same sequences, okay? Another important thing to note is that they're clustered together. So all in the same genome or all in the same set, you've got one, two, three, four, five, six different resistance genes against four different antibiotics. But here's the real sort of killer observation. These yellow things here, they're the genes that govern horizontal gene transfer. Anything between those yellow things can in one step move from one bacterium to another bacterium. So what does that mean? One transfer event between one of these soil bugs and one of these pathogens in either direction can take something that is susceptible to four antibiotic classes and completely turn it multi-drug resistant to all four of those classes. And this is what's uh, sort of why this particular single piece of evidence was scary. To say non-pathogenic soil bacteria in random US soils happen to be in exchange with a whole bunch of really nasty pathogens, right? So providing evidence that this actually does occur. And it has occurred very, very recently. Okay, so we did this, but remember we did this bizarro experiment up front, right? We happened to culture up these bugs that could eat antibiotics. That doesn't represent most microbes on the planet, hopefully. So we wanted to ask, is this observation, these multi-drug resistant bacteria that look like bugs that are in hospitals, but happen to be in the soil, which happen to have exchanged uh, resistance with the clinic, is that the rule? Are we really, should we really be freaking out? Uh, or perhaps is it the exception? What does the, the picture look at you know, most of the other bugs out there? Because remember, we did a culturing experiment, the 1%. What about the other 99 to 99.9%? .9 so to ask that question, whether this is the rule of exception, Kevin now teamed up with Sankit Patel in the lab to expand this out to a large collection of soils. Now I'm gonna warn you, the next slide is perhaps the busiest slide I've shown you, and I've shown you some busy slides, but I'll try to keep uh, to the punchline. Okay, we now went and with some collaborators at the University of Colorado, got access to 18 different soil samples. The details of the soils don't matter. It's just that about half of them were from Minnesota, half of them were from Michigan. The important part, kind of like the humans we've talked about so far, they've not been treated with any antibiotics. So they've not been dumped with any kind of contamination. Natural soils, natural variation. Kevin and Sankit applied this method and said, okay, without culture, how many resistance genes across these 18 soils? They found 3,000, okay? Now what is 3,000 again? How do I contextualize that number? There is a database called the Antibiotic Resistance Database. I'll let you guess what is in that database. Um, that database at the time that Kevin and Sankit did this study had the most exhaustive catalog of all known resistance genes that had come out of pathogens. And there were something like 15,000 genes in there. In one single experiment across 18 soils, they had now represented one-fifth of that database. Again, emphasizing the fact that we've vastly undercounted resistance genes, okay? So what did they find? Uh, this particular plot here compares the composition of the bacteria in the soils to their resistance genes. You don't have to worry about all the details that go behind, and there are a lot of details. The important part is that we found in this particular case, the type of bacteria in the soil could help us predict the resistance genes that were there. They were very, very tightly linked. But what does that mean? What does that mean in terms of everything I've said so far? If based on the type of bacterium you can tell me what resistance genes that are there, it probably means that there's not a lot of horizontal gene transfer going on, right? Because horizontal gene transfer is gonna obscure those connections. It can move between very unrelated bacteria. 
if I can classify these particular genes by their bacteria, there appears to be this tight linkage. So maybe it's not as bad as the previous study. And in fact, we're able to confirm that by exactly looking at those genes that are involved in, in horizontal gene transfer. We could count the frequency that any one of these 3,000 genes was found next to one of these mobilization elements, one of these genes that move back genes between bacteria. And we're fortunately able to find that most soil bugs have way fewer of these mobilization genes flanking their resistance genes compared to pathogens that are going through our clinic. So where does that put us? How do you reconcile these two particular studies? How does this help us maybe design policy going towards the future? Well, our working model is exactly like Julian Davies posited, the soil is rife with resistance genes, but that resistance selection is ancient. The bugs have them, and they're not necessarily needed, they don't need to exchange them with other bugs around them because they're all resistant, which means they've not maintained the capacity necessarily to move them around. So most bugs, even though they're resistant, are probably not at great risk in terms of donating resistance genes to the clinic. But they happen to be this exceptionally important minority. These proteobacteria, these multi-drug resistant bugs that can transcend habitats. They can live in the soil, they can live in the ventilation system, they can live on the nurse's call button, and they can live in us. They can move back and forth, and also unfortunately have the ability to move resistance genes back and forth. So it helps us now begin to think about that we're not overwhelmed with a ton of data that we need to worry about. We maybe just need to focus on a specific group of bugs in terms of the transmission of resistance between the environment and the clinic. Okay, so in the last few minutes I have remaining, I'm gonna try to, I've, you know, I've never done this before. I always end on this really dour note of we might all die, uh, <laughs> uh, which, I mean, we're all gonna die, uh, but hopefully after long, healthy lives. Um, but we have now begun in the last few years um, to try to address this problem, right? We know resistance is everywhere. We know bacteria are keeping ahead of the game. What can we do to begin to turn that tide, right? Because we know that Otherwise, we are a bit doomed, right? So in fact, here are the scary things that the CDC puts out, right? All of these nasty, I mean, actually kind of cute looking bugs that'll do nasty things to us, right? They're all drug resistant, they're killing lots and lots of people, and in fact, here's a little fungus just to maintain diversity here. Um, and you know, you guys have probably all heard about MRSA, this, this skin commensal that can cause havoc. And that's the one we decided to focus on, methicillin resistant staph aureus. Could we think of clever ways in which to kill this drug-resistant organism that kills 11,000 people in the US alone. Okay, so we went to the literature and said, what do we know about methods to uh, maybe use what bacteria do against them? Can we use this concept of evolution to switch the selection pressure, right? It's the resistant ones that keep wiping out or, or defeating the susceptible ones. Can we do something that, that basically gives the wild type bacteria, the good bacteria, the susceptible bacteria, the advantage, okay? So that we can then kill them. Um, and so this idea of selection inversion is sort of schematized here. Imagine you have a, a combination of wild types of susceptible bacteria, the yellow ones, and drug resistant ones against a particular drug, uh, which are represented in blue. Normally what would happen is you'd hit this with an antibiotic, all of the yellow ones get wiped out, you've got resistant bugs, yeah? If you can now figure out some way to invert the selection, to give the wild types an advantage, right? You apply that selection, whatever that happens to be, and I'll tell you a couple examples of how to do that. Now you've only got the yellow ones around, then you hit them with the antibiotics and they're gone, okay? So how do you do that? One idea comes from something that's familiar to many of us, of sort of the crop rotation idea, right? You cycle drugs, you use drug A for a little while, maybe after a while you'll get resistance to drug A, and then you'd come up with drug B. And as long as drug A and drug B are different enough, right, you'll keep wiping out the resistant population, and this will work for a while. Now, unfortunately, I just showed you a scenario where in a single horizontal gene transfer event, a bug can get resistance to four or five different drugs. So on its own, this is not a very sustainable idea, but you can use it for a while. But this is an idea of a potential idea of, of inversion selection, right? So you're, you're, you're using the idea of, of orthogonal uh, selections uh, together. The, the other one is recognizing that these molecules don't sometimes act completely independently. When we talk about drug A and drug B, their effect, their potency, their impact on microbes is not always the simple sum of their parts. Sometimes they can do this thing called synergy. They can be better together, right? Uh, and another way of thinking about that is a synergistic drug combination has the same effect at a lower concentration 
than any of the drugs on their own, right? This also has another real advantage where the toxicity is lower, right? Some of the drugs that we don't use are not because they won't kill the bacterium, it's the fact that it'll kill the bacterium and it'll wipe out your liver at the same time, which is not a good trade-off, right? Um, so if you can use these synergistic combinations, these induced synergies, maybe you can use, use less drug uh, and maybe you can use more and more drugs together. And then the final one is this concept called collateral sensitivity. So what is collateral sensitivity? It refers to how resistance to one drug impacts the ability of that bug to interact with another drug, okay? So I'll give you the example here I've shown with three uh, drugs because that's what we've done our work with. But let's just take the simple example of two antibiotics, antibiotic A and antibiotic B. Collateral sensitivity is the case where should a bacterium become resistant to A, it automatically becomes more susceptible to B. Reciprocal collateral sensitivity is when it happens in both directions. Resistant to A, more susceptible to B. Resistant to B, more susceptible to A. If you can find such combinations of, of drugs, you've really stumbled upon a really nice interaction that you can take advantage of in terms of this inversion selection. And in fact, you can apply it to either of these two cases, right? You can do it with cycling. Wouldn't it be great if you had collaterally sensitive drugs, you give drug A, as soon as you become resistant to drug A, you're now even worse as a bug against drug B, and then you put drug B on. Now you can keep cycling and almost infinitely, right? And you can do the same thing with synergy. What if you have a synergistic combination that is also collaterally sensitive. Now what happens is you're using low concentrations of the two drugs. Say the bug becomes resistant to A. Now B is left on its own, but it works a lot better because it was collaterally sensitive. And that's exactly what we decided to test. Could we put these concepts together to come up with new combinations of older drugs that could go after one of these drug resistant scourges to maybe kick the ball a few yards down the field? So that's what we decided to try. We went after this little baddie here, MRSA, methicillin-resistant Staph aureus. Methicillin is in the penicillin class, the same serendipitous class of, of Fleming, right? It's the most widely used group of drugs. They call the beta-lactams. Okay, so what do you know about MRSA? It kills over 11,000 people in the US alone, many more uh, globally. It's resistant in terms of most of its strains to the latest antibiotics, so it's getting worse and worse. Uh, the beta-lactams, as I mentioned, which met the is a class of, they're the largest antibiotic class available to us. They represent about 50% of, uh, of antibiotic doses. And unfortunately, and this gets into some of the MRSA details, the way MRSA is resistant to these beta-lactams is redundantly. It has many different mechanisms that all work together to knock out beta-lactams. So it's, it's, it's sort of smartly evolved ways in which if you give it you know, one antibiotic and even another antibiotic, maybe it'll get rid of it in multiple ways. But it was this exact idea, we're like, well, if the bacteria is smart about this or it thinks it's smart about this, maybe we can use that as its Achilles heel. Maybe because it's got its interacting parts, we'll use it against it in terms of this induced synergy. Okay? Uh, and an important concept here is we decided to, to set our, our sights even higher in a sense. We said, Look, we're gonna to try to look for combinations of drugs that have been obsolete against MRSA for decades, right? So one of the reasons to do that is because you can rescue the largest class of drugs, but the other is because it's probably not seen selection pressure to those drugs for a while, right? So maybe we can bring them back and again, we can again treat it for a little bit. And so that was our goal. Can we rescue this largest class of drugs against MRSA by combining them in particular ways using this concept from, from inversion selection? And we did. So we came up with three particular antibiotics in the beta-lactam class. Two are real antibiotics, meropenem and peperacillin. You don't have to worry about what they are, but what defines them as beta-lactams are these four-membered rings. Okay? And then tazobactam, which happens to look a lot like them. It has that four-membered ring, but happens to be an inhibitor of a resistance mechanism. So we said, well, if you have a resistance mechanism, people have figured this out before, there are special compounds that could inactivate that resistance mechanism. So can we put these compounds together to go after MRSA in a sort of big way? And so the first thing we did was, after a large amount of screening, which I'm skipping over, an entire PhD project, in fact, uh, we're able to come up with this as a novel triple synergistic combination that could kill MRSA. And when I say kill MRSA, we did it against the, the um, you know, a particular type pathogen, and then we went to our clinical collaborators and said, you know, give us from your freezer a random MRSA isolates that represent things that are in the clinic and in, a, in the community, and they could kill all of them. It didn't matter with these, you know, about 100 or so that we screened. 
And this particular plot just represents what that synergy looks like to say that if they were all additive, right along this 3D axis, they would fall along these planes. And the fact that they fall in this sort of shallow well suggests that they're using much lower concentrations to have the same killing effect as opposed to the compounds on their own. Okay, so A, they're synergistic, all three of those compounds. Uh, the second is that they were also collaterally sensitive. And this really was the important part, right? That we had a combination of synergistic compounds that were also collaterally sensitive, which happens to be a fairly rare and unique property, but we think this is the thing that could change the paradigm through which we start combining antibiotics. Because, again, if you have a synergistic and collaterally sensitive combination, if the bug was to become resistant to any one component, you now automatically activate the other components. And that's exactly what we found. Again, this particular interaction diagram just sort of tells you the experiments we did. We we're able to show that by now targeting multiple different nodes in the cell wall, which is what the beta-lactams do, we did not allow, we not only killed MRSA, we didn't allow any resistance evolution to occur. And the way we tested it was basically we took high concentrations and low concentrations of these drugs, and we took MRSA and we tried to force it to be resistant, right? We passaged it over and over and over again, over 11 days of continuous passage, and not a single cell of MRSA survived. So we're able to kill it and not allow it to evolve resistance, okay? Um, and then, of course, if you really want to move this back into humans, you not need to start doing animal studies, and we did that, and we happened to collaborate with the group at Notre Dame, which has a very, very aggressive infection model in mice of MRSA. It's called a neutropenic bacteremia model. Uh, the, again, the, the words don't matter. What it means is, if you give MRSA to that mouse, its internal organs liquefy in about a day, and it's really, really bad for that mouse, yeah? Uh, we were able to find that our combination over the total course of that, um, uh, that infection wiped out the infection in a day, and the mice were happier than even the mice that survived with the latest generation antibiotic. So it worked just as well as a linazolid, one of these late generation antibiotics, which costs a lot of money. Now here's an important thing to notice about the drug combination that we've just come up with, right? This meropenem, piperacillin, and tazobactam. These are all off-patent drugs. These are drugs you can use now, right? So we've now just rescued an entire class of antibiotics against one of the worst pathogens out there using drugs that are, that, you know, that we've known about for a really long time that work just as well as an exceptionally uh, um, uh, sort of fancy uh, uh, and good drug, right? And, uh, and, and again, it has this added benefit that not only does it kill uh, uh, MRSA, it suppresses the evolution of new resistance. Now again, will it suppress the resistance forever? Absolutely not. Right? If we just rely on a one combination of this type, eventually MRSA will acquire genes from someone else. In fact, what made MRSA MRSA was it acquired a resistance gene from another bacterium six, you know, in the 1960s. Uh, but this tells us that at least for now, we have an antibiotic combination that's not irresistible, but it is hard to resist. And we think this paradigm, more than this combination itself, this paradigm of combining synergy uh, with collateral sensitivity may allow us to rescue large numbers of old drugs especially because it allows us to use lower and lower concentrations of them. Okay, so with that, again, I just wanna end my talk today uh, with reminding you that we think it's really critical in this era of increasing antibiotic resistance to appreciate the ecology of resistance, to appreciate the ecology of microbes, and perhaps even start thinking of future generation therapies from this ecological perspective of things working together and what the interactions are. Uh, but one thing I haven't talked to you about today, and I think it's something that those of you who go away and, and think about public policy and antibiotic use should really keep in mind is uh, that 80% of antibiotics by weight in this country are used as growth promoters in food animals. Okay? And I would argue that is not a good use of these life-saving chemo chemotherapeutics. If you've taken any way, anything away from my talk, it's that we're running out of these drugs. Right? We need them to treat us, we need them to treat our kids, we need them to treat our kids' kids. And if we keep using at these scales, we're gonna run out of them, right? Uh, and so, um, again, we have some work going on to think about how to address this problem. Uh, and, and I wanna emphasize that the, the way to address this problem is not simply banning the use of antibiotics, right? We are dependent on our food. Uh, but that perhaps there are, again, ecological ways of thinking of well, ultimately, if you want cheaper meat, you just want to make sure that the inputs 
cost less than the output. So maybe there are alternative strategies to get healthier, larger animals without the use of antibiotics. And one way is to figure out why is it that the antibiotics work? Why do they work at sub-therapeutic concentrations to give you a, f a bigger sow, uh, right? Uh, and it might most likely be because of their internal microbiota. Because we're changing what the composition is in their guts, and it's allowing them to be a little bit more productive. So maybe there are probiotic therapies. Maybe there are other compounds that don't have the same selection pressure that will still allow a vibrant animal industry without using this last line defense that we have for ourselves. Okay, and so with that, again, I'll thank you. I'll thank, again, the, the incredible group of people who are currently in the lab as well as folks who have recently left. I tried to mention many of the collaborators uh, who we work with both domestically and internationally. Uh, Washington University is an, an amazing place to do science, uh, as is St. Louis. Uh, and, and again, I only touched on a few people that we work with. Um, and uh, of course, you know that science doesn't happen without money and we've been fortunate to have uh, uh, good donors. So um, with that, please remember this and I'm happy to take questions. That's a great question. Yeah, okay, so um, forgive me for nerding out for a second, right? I, there's not a simple answer to this question. Ciprofloxacin is a synthetic compound. It targets the DNA gyrase and the top isomerase. These are enzymes that hold DNA apart, double-strand DNA, so that can it can be replicated. What the ciprofloxacin and its, its compounds do is it goes and they gunk up those enzymes and hold that DNA open. And the DNA will then, because it's open, cause double-stranded breaks, and then your sort of genome falls apart, okay? That mechanism happens to be dominant recessive. What I mean by that is, as long as you have the wild-type enzyme, the gyrase and the topoisomerase, at least some of it around, ciprofloxacin will go in and will allow it to be killed. Which means if you bring a resistant DNA uh, gyrase or topoisomerase in, like we would in our assays, it'll not rescue that cell. Because there's still wild type versions of those target enzymes around that'll still cause enough damage for it to die. So that's, that, so it's an idiosyncrasy in a sense of our assay. Ciprofloxacin resistance exists. It's just that the dominant mechanism happens to be something you can't trivially transfer in the context of the wild type cell. Now, the unfortunate news is that's just the early work we've done. <laughs> when we've gone and looked at more and more ecosystems, right? Um, so to give you context, I showed you maybe, you know, between the soil and the humans, uh, maybe 50 of these functional studies that we've done in the lab, 50 samples, right? We've now done that for about uh, 500 or 600, and we've found transferable ciprofloxacin resistance genes. It's a rare genotype. We just don't see it all over the place, but now we, we, we're beginning to catch some of these, these genes too. It's a great question, and I would argue that, so of course that, that particular plot ended in 2010. You might argue that there's even fewer large pharma companies in antibiotics, right? Um, I think that was before Pfizer pulled out, AstraZeneca has basically pulled out as well. There are very, very few big pharma companies left doing true antibiotic development. Now there are smaller antibiotic development programs that are, are, are stepping up. There are also other uh, um, uh, ways in which to think of going after bacteria uh, they're in the broader class of anti-infectives, right? So um, when we think of antibiotics as traditional small molecules, they have all of this collateral damage to these shotgun molecules, right? What if we were to find new types of compounds that just went after the pathogens, just went after the virulence factor, for instance? So there's a whole new era of research um, which is trying to sort of reinvent the way we think of going after bacteria. 
If we do that, uh, we'll at least address the resistance part. But what about the economics, right? As you said, if I'm a drug company, and especially I'm a publicly traded drug company, uh, I'm beholden to my shareholders, do I make something which is everyone above the age of 50 has to take every day of their lives in terms of keeping their heart health good? Or do I give something that if it's effective, right, an antibiotic, it'll only last for a few days? So that is a little bit backwards. And what's being proposed right now, I mean, the, in, the, in the recent budget that was approved, there's a doubling of, of research for antibiotic resistance and, uh, uh, and, uh, and, and antibiotic development. And also some commercial uh, sort of incentive schemes to say, you know what, right now it's true. If you, not only is it the case that if you had a really effective drug, uh, is, is that would not be as good as something you take every day. But the thing that I would tell you to do if you came with a really effective drug is not use it. <laughs> to keep it as a drug of last resort, which is even less economically viable. So then there are considerations to say maybe we need to come up with economic structures basically to incentivize drug companies that do this, to maybe give them some, you know, some, some amount of money back for the R&D and the amount of time that they don't get to use their drug. Now these are politically difficult issues and it requires uh, you know, unfortunately, it probably needs more people to die of this before uh, enough policy change will come through, right? Uh, a, a cynical view about this is, think of our success with HIV, right? We turned the tide on that infectious disease. It's no longer an acute killer. It's a chronic disease, right? But why did that work? It's because we had a lobby. We had enough people who were sick, enough celebrities who were sick, enough people who knew people who were sick, who lobbied Congress, and if you think of who, who funds this research, the NIH, right? There are eight study sections, eight independent groups of people who still review HIV work. And I'm not saying it, it's, it's amazing, it's great that we did that, right? There is a single study section that looks at all of antibiotic development and resistance, right? Because not enough people die of it yet. So I think once the tide turns, it'll come to a cost ben benefit analysis. You know, the reason that those numbers are so high in terms of people dying by 2050, it's not just because of infections. It's the idea that if you get enough drug resistance, forget about cancer chemotherapy. You will no longer have that as an option. But the reason cancer chemotherapy works is because under those immunosuppressive regimes, when you're exceptionally susceptible, you have antibiotics to treat you, right? So you might be able to go in for that first week of chemo and get killed by drug-resistant isolate. Forget about hip replacement. The thoughts are, if you get the resistance rates going the way they are, every third person who goes in for hip replacement will die. Not because the replacement wasn't good, it's because they get infected with something that we can't um, uh, 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 treat. At that point, I guarantee you that the economics will be good for drug companies to get into the game. I'm worried that that'll be too late. So right now, I think we need a little bit of public will to say, let's invest now. Let's start stockpiling on some of these particular chemotherapeutics so that we can begin to turn the tide before it's too late. Yeah, no, that's a great point. And if you look at a lot of the initiatives that have been proposed with people who talk about the prudent use of antibiotics, and even just in, in terms of maintaining sort of microbiota health, one of the best things we can do is better education about issues like this to our primary health caregivers, right? To, uh, and also, I think we have to change, in a sense, our incentive scheme. It's really hard to be a pediatrician in this country if a parent comes to you and says, you need to give me an antibiotic for my kid's ear infection or else, right? What is that pediatrician gonna do? They'll either lose that business or they might get sued. It's easier for them in the era where you think, well, there's no downside to antibiotics. Let's give the antibiotic, right? So I think, say what? Exactly. So, so it, it, it's, it's an exceptionally hard issue. And I think, yes, we're trying to, to have outreach to tell pediatricians that this is, this is a problem. I mean, there's also a parallel research. I've only given you the example of antibiotic resistance being the downside with antibiotics. There's a lot of good research coming out of Marty Blazer's lab and others at NYU, for instance, that suggests, at least in animal models, that low-dose antibiotics and persistent antibiotics, in animal models at least, is associated with obesity, right? So there may be even links, and we don't know that for sure, links between childhood obesity epidemics in this country and worldwide with the wanton use of antibiotics. Also keep in mind that when we talk about antibiotics here, 
um, some of those antibiotic residues may be coming in through our food system, right? We think of them as being not in our milk and not in our meats, but we're not completely sure because we can't test every piece of meat and every you know, milliliter of milk. So yes, I think it requires education. It requires campaigns of the type that you're describing with our primary caregivers, but there, our healthcare people will not be able to do anything if we don't incentivize our parents, right? And our patients to not demand these compounds that they don't need. So in this case, we propose that we give it as a combination. So there are ways, as I've said, that other people have shown that you can use some of these collaterally sensitive uh, compounds that can be used cycling through. But in this case, for it to actually be synergistic, they have to be given at the same time because they do work actually together. Uh, so, of course. Thank you very much. Of course.